Good morning. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday after Easter. I'm not sure, does it say Palm Sunday in the bulletin? Mm -hmm. I forgot to change that. <laughs> well, oh well, it's Palm Sunday somewhere. I should probably not. Anyway, I'm glad you can join us on Facebook or YouTube or reading this worship at your home. Uh, thank you also for continuing your support for the, to the mission of First English with your gifts and offerings. Just a couple of announcements. Holy, uh, the highway cleanup will be on Saturday, April 24th. Please call John Morrill. His number is in the directory to sign up. And we really could use about 12 people to really make the work go quick. Today, the second Sunday of Easter is Holy Humor or Bright Sunday. The week after Easter, the early church would gather with joy and laughter and jokes to celebrate the great joke God played on evil by raising Jesus from death to life. So today, scattered throughout the service will be hopefully funny stories for us to continue the joy of Easter. We continue with the thanksgiving for baptism. We worship today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts, shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Funny story number one, getting dressed for church. Growing up, you had your school shoes, play shoes, and church shoes, and there was no mixing. You could not go to school in play shoes. You could not worship in school shoes. Including travel time, you wore the church shoes maybe three hours a week, which is about how long you spent looking for them every Sunday morning. <laughs> Where did they go between Sunday afternoon and Saturday night? And if you did find one shoe, there was no guarantee that the other was nearby. If you were a boy, you had church pants. These could not be jeans. They could be corduroy, but only if you did not like corduroy. They could not button or snap. They had to close with that metal tab that slid underneath the tiny metal bridge. And somehow during the week, that bridge would get smushed so the tab would never fit. And your mom had to pry it open with a butter knife. Then you had to add a belt, which took time to find as it had apparently run off with the missing shoe. I remember those pants. We continue with our opening hymn, hymn 384, that Easter day, hymn 384. <clears throat>
We continue with our call to worship, which is Psalm 133. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. How good it is, how wonderful, wherever people live as one. It is like sacred oil on the head, flowing down Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, running down the mountains of Zion. There God gives blessing, life forever. We pray. Almighty God, with the joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection, by the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all we say and do, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading, uh, reading is from the first letter of John. The opening, letter, opening of this letter serves as a reality check. The reality of God is light, but our confessed reality has been sin. God cleanses us from our sinful reality through Christ's death, so we live in fellowship with Christ and walk in God's light. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This, this life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so our joy may be complete. This is the message we heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with God while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do, and do, not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and God's word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so, that, so you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Lord. John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. The story of Easter continues as the risen Jesus appears to his disciples appears to his disciples, period. His words to Thomas offer a blessing to all who entrust themselves in faith to the risen Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jewish temple leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If we retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Unless I see the mark of the nailed, nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, 
Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Time for the children's sermon. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to read part of our gospel story from the Bible called The Message by Eugene Peterson. I'm going to read John chapter 20, verse 23. In the message it says, If you forgive the someone's sins, they are gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? I like that because it got me thinking about the whole of this gospel story that we have today about Jesus and the disciples. Now we often focus on Thomas in this story, maybe because we don't want to be like Thomas, we want to be included in what Jesus does for his disciples, or maybe because we feel blessed that we have not seen Jesus and yet we still believe. But I want to think about this in a different way. I wonder how Thomas felt. How did he feel about Jesus dying? How did he feel about his friends seeing Jesus when he wasn't there? I wonder how Thomas felt about Jesus appearing to them, but not him. Was he hurt? Angry? Sad? Well, we can't really know, but we can think about those times when we are sad or hurt, or angry. It can be very, very difficult to let those feelings go. We want to hold on to them tightly. We want to hold on to whatever it was that made us feel this way. We want to hold on to that anger against our brother, our sister, or our friend who hurt us. We are slow to forgive. But as the message says, if we hold on to those sins, What are we going to do with them? Jesus appears to Thomas and opens a path for Thomas to let go, to forgive, which is what we all need, right, at some point. We need to let go of that hurt, let go of that anger, let go of those sins that people have done against us. Because what else are we going to do with them? We're just going to hold on to them. Hold on to that anger, that hurt, that sadness. With Jesus' help, with Jesus' strength, we can let them go and forgive. Let's pray. Loving God, in this season of Easter, we celebrate your victory over sin and death. We rejoice in the freedom of your love and mercy. 
teach us to forgive and to show mercy that, so we can be free from the weight of sin and grudges. Amen. Funny story number two. One Sunday, I was sitting behind the pastor's wife and their two children. When the pastor entered the pulpit, the seven-year-old seven asked, Mom, can I be excused to go to the nursery? Mom replied, No, you're too old to go to the nursery. And the child responded loudly, But Mom, I heard Dad practicing the sermon last night, and it's a long one. Hopefully this is not too long for you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Creator, and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I know I've talked about this before on the second Sunday of Easter, because it's always Thomas Sunday, but Thomas has every right to feel irritated and annoyed at the way the church remembers him. Based on this one story, he gets an adjective. Doubting, right? Doubting Thomas. And this is a problem, well, for Thomas and for us, because we don't hear anything else. We see the story or we hear the story and we think, oh yeah, Doubting Thomas. And that's all we hear. But really, Thomas is no more of a doubter than the rest of the disciples. And this story is not primarily about doubt. It is about the risen Christ and how he responds to our need for faith. I'm going to look at Thomas first, though, and see how his doubt compares to the other disciples. Thomas is absent when Jesus appears the first time and shows the disciples his hands and his feet and his side. Now, his absence may just be a credit to him because John says the reason the rest are behind locked doors is because they are afraid. So Thomas's absence may suggest he is braver than the rest. Either way, anyway, when Thomas comes back and they say, we've seen Jesus, Thomas is skeptical. And why not? He knows Jesus is dead very dead, hung on a cross, stabbed with a spear just to make sure. Thomas is no fool. He knows death when he sees it. Others may be somewhat gullible, but Thomas needs to be sure. I need to see the nail marks and the hole where the spear went in before I can believe. That's fair, right? After all, that's the reaction the rest of the disciples have when Mary Magdalene tells them she's seen Jesus alive. They still hide behind the locked doors, afraid to go out. To single Thomas out as the doubting one is unfair. He does have doubts, sure, but no worse than the rest. And maybe, maybe he is a bit braver. Perhaps the reason he gets singled out is because he is the only one not there the first time Jesus appears. And so in his story, we see the individual version of what the other disciples went through all together. But I'm guessing if we heard the individual stories of Peter and Andrew and John and James and the rest of them, I'm guessing they would all talk about how the risen Christ, breaking through each one's fears and doubts and bringing joy and faith. And so we could say Thomas's story is every disciple's story. And that Thomas's story is your story and my story. And so what does this story tell us about this risen Christ who meets us like he met Thomas? Well, perhaps the most surprising thing people who think of Thomas as the doubter and think of doubt as sin is Jesus does not rebuke him for his lack of faith. He doesn't say, oh, ye of little faith. Instead, Jesus takes seriously what Thomas says he needs to help him believe. 
And Jesus gives him just that thing. Which is not all that surprising. The writer of Hebrews says Jesus knows our realities. He knows weakness. He knows testing just like us. And so we can confidently ask for what we need. And that's what Thomas does. Unless I see with my eyes the marks, I will not believe. And Jesus, understanding where Thomas is, says, okay, here, see, touch. You know, maybe Thomas should have believed when the others told him. Maybe the others should have believed when, when Mary Magdalene told them. But they didn't. And Thomas didn't. But Jesus meets them where they are, not where they should have been. This is not a story of rebuke and judgment, but of hope and promise. Jesus is far more interested in whether we believe than how we come to faith. And that's why those two stories of faith are the same. Not all of us saw a blinding light on the road to Damascus, like Paul. None of us have touched the wounds of Jesus, like Thomas. But Jesus reaches out to you and me in whatever way we need for us to believe and trust in him. And as John makes clear at the end of today's reading, we can't have the opportunity Thomas had. But there is enough written down and passed on for us to know what we need to know and hear what we need to hear and follow Jesus into faith. These things are written down so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. There are some who like to play a game with this. They raise the bar and then raise the bar and then raise the bar. So no matter how Jesus reaches out, they demand another sign, another miracle, another proof before they'll believe. But not Thomas. His doubts and fears are real. When Jesus breaks through and dispels those doubts and fears, Thomas falls to his knees saying, my Lord and my God. You and I have responded to Jesus along with Thomas. What took us across the line from doubt to faith, from fear to trust, is different for each of us. And what it was doesn't really matter. Jesus met us where we were. And when we saw him, when we recognized him, we fell to our knees and confessed, my Lord and my God. We may not have done it suddenly and literally like Thomas did, for some, faith just kind of crept up on us. We don't know exactly when we started to believe. But we know our lives are lived in ongoing trust and belief and faith that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God forever. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Funny story number three. Touring New York City, a young family decides to visit St. Patrick's Cathedral. The kids were especially curious about the votive candles, and the priest asked if they would like to light one. He explained it was customary to say a prayer, a petition, something you want, or thanksgiving when lighting the candles. And he was careful to tell the kids that the votives were not like birthday candles. We I mean, make a wish. Do you have any questions, he asked. Well, no, said the little girl, but if there's a pony outside, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> we move into the prayers on that note. For the prayers, I will end each petition with the words, Hear us, O God. And your response is, Your mercy is great. Alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers to God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. You shower your church with grace, O God. Unite the whole church on earth, so that with one heart it testifies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ with power and love. Bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Anne, Pastor Jack and Manwani Parish, and missionary Pastor Alex. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. You proclaim the blessing of life forever. Like dew upon the mountains, refresh your creation. Restore waters, cleanse the air, and provide revitalizing rains to dry lands. Give your whole creation the promise of new life. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. You direct the nations, O God. Guide all in authority, that they guide their people in the way of your love. Defeat in us our impulse to war. Bestow the peace of Christ on those in authority, and breathe on them the Holy Spirit. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. You place within the heart of the church a spirit of sharing. Give us the power of your generous spirit, May we provide for the needs of others. Announce your peace to those who are lonely, hurting, suffering, or afraid. Especially Al, Liz, Carol, Dolores, Delbert, Tom, Janie, Mary, Kay, Kathy, Gary, Ron, Bruce, Reese, Joan, Matt, Bob, Thomas, the family of Jim Marth, and all with COVID-19. For medical researchers, hospital personnel, doctors and nurses, especially Deb, Holly, Joy, Kara, Taylor, Lily, Olivia, Todd, Reese, Pat, and Bonnie. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. You give us fellowship with one another in this faith community of First English. Shine the light of the risen Christ in our life together. May we live in love for one another, and our joy may be complete. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. O God, now hear the prayers of your people. You share the gift of eternal life. In thanksgiving and remembrance, we recall the lives and gifts of loved ones who now live in endless joy and peace, especially Jim. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you, have, as you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and respond to people in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by God's Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing our sending song in 376, Thine is the Glory. story for Holy Humor Sunday. A Minneapolis couple decided to go to Florida to thaw out during a particularly, particularly icy winter. They planned to stay at the same hotel where they spent their honeymoon 20 years earlier. Aww. Oh. <laughs> because of their hectic schedules, it was difficult for the couple to coordinate their travel plans. So the husband left Minnesota and flew to Florida on Thursday while his wife planned to fly down the following day. The husband checked into the hotel and there was a computer in his room, so he decided to send an email to his wife. However, he accident, accidentally left out one letter of her email address and sent the email without realizing his error. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a pastor who was called home to glory after a heart attack. The widow decided to check her email, expecting condolence messages from family and friends. But after reading her very first email, she screamed and fainted. The widow's son rushed into the room, found his mother on the floor, and saw the computer screen, which read, To my loving wife, subject, I've just arrived today. I know you are surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you are allowed to send emails to your loved ones. Since I've just arrived, I thought I would send you an email. Everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> May our glorious laughing God grant you a spirit of wisdom and joy to 
to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the light of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.